what else would do if his dinner took longer than his bed would be at. All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, let me thank everyone for showing up tonight. Uh, we, we got held up a little bit because dinner took longer than expected, so I'm glad that we still arrived on time. And thank you for coming out. Um, I know that it's kind of a wet day, so it was kind of sad outside, but we were still able to have this debate, so we really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank the union, uh, the tech crew, for setting up all the sound, all the video, and the footage for tonight. Um, and even for the live stream audience for tuning into this debate. And let me thank both of the panelists for contributing tonight. Uh, my name is Swan Sona. I'm a freshman here at K-State studying philosophy and political science. I serve as the president of Young Americans for Liberty here at KSU. You can join our Facebook group or follow us on OrgSync. Also, don't forget to sign up on our email list so we can send you more updates on the special events we have planned. We meet every first and last Saturday of the month except during final exam season. Uh, finally, Young Americans for Liberty is dedicated to protecting civil liberties, limited government, peaceful foreign policy, and free markets. In the spirit of this organization, I have started Liberty Talks 2.0, a program dedicated to students like you who want to have more discussions and debates. If you have a topic related to liberty that fascinates you, then email me at suan at ksu.edu, and we'll see if we can organize a debate like this one or have you on the panel debating. Now, to the part you're actually here for. Timothy Shaw is a professor of philosophy at Grantham University, an adjunct professor of philosophy at Park University and Johnson County Community College. He specializes in the intersection of applied ethics and political philosophy. He has published numerous peer-reviewed articles in journals such as Public Affairs Quarterly, the Journal of Agricultural and Environmental uh, Ethics, and Philosophia. Our second speaker is John Harrington, and it's an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy uh, and a Munson Simu faculty star in the College of Arts and Sciences at Kansas State University. His research focuses on questions in political philosophy and applied ethics, with a particular interest in public health, security, and the ethics of emerging technologies. Previously, he was a research fellow in the Medicine, Ethics, Society, and History Unit of the University of Birmingham. He completed his PhD in philosophy at the Australian National University. Now to the format of tonight's uh, discussion slash debate. We will begin with a 20 minute opening statement by Professor Shao, followed by a 10 minute response from Dr. Harrington. Let me emphasize that we agreed to the time slots and we are not stacking the odds against Dr. Harrington. <laughs> Furthermore, this is not a debate along partisan lines. You're not gonna hear one side say, let's have guns and nukes and, let's, and then the other side saying, let's have no guns at all. This is meant to be a reasonable discussion between two experts in this field, trying to get to at the heart of what we should do and how we should view our moral rights associated with gun ownership. 
So after those opening remarks, I'll have a 30-minute discussion between the two of them and then open up the final 30 minutes of tonight for Q&A uh, with you, the audience. Professor Shao, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for having me. I'm grateful to the K-State uh, Young Americans for Liberty for inviting me to speak and for Prof Professor Harrington uh, for agreeing to participate in tonight's discussion. I want to begin by clearly stating what I will be arguing for in tonight's discussion. I will defend two claims. First, there is a moral right to own firearms. Second, this moral right is not defeated by the empirical evidence. I will not be talking about the legal right to keep and bear arms. Although I believe that the Constitution does protect such a right, my goal here is to establish a more fundamental basis for gun rights. In other words, if the Second Amendment never existed, the government would still be obligated to allow individual gun ownership for purely moral reasons. So let's turn to the first claim, which is that there is a moral right to own firearms. A right is a claim or entitlement to do something or to have something provided to you. We can think of rights as moral shields that protect us as we pursue our fulfillment. Rights provide us with protection by carving out a moral space for us that others are obligated to respect, whether that be through non-interference by, or by positively providing us with something. While there's a lot I could say about the nature of rights, let's take as our starting point the right to life. To say that I have the right to life is to say that I am entitled to my continued existence, such that my life may not be taken away from me, at least not without a morally sufficient reason. Now, the right to life is arguably our most fundamental right. It is the foundation on which all of our other rights stand, in the sense that our other rights protect the various components necessary for a life well lived. For example, bodily integrity, property ownership, and freedom of expression are all deserving of respect because they are integral elements of a good life. In that sense, all of our ancillary rights presuppose the right to life. If we don't have the right to life, then we don't have any rights at all. Now, since the purpose of a right is to protect my well-being, the possession of a right entitles me to protect that which I have a right to. Thus, if I possess the right to life, then I must also possess the corresponding right to protect my life using whatever means necessary, consistent with the rights of others. This includes the right of self-defense, which is the right to protect one's life by means of force. Because it flows from my right to life, self-defense is a right that I, as an individual, possess. I may partially delegate this right to the police and other authorities, but I cannot surrender it completely. The right to life is, like the right to, the right to self-defense is, like the right to life from which it's derived, an inalienable right that I cannot part with. Now, the right to life is the right to use force to protect life, but I cannot use force without using some means of force, whether it be a stick, a knife, or even just my arms and legs. Exercising self-defense requires that I do something, but in order to do something, I must first possess some means of doing so. So if I possess the right of self-defense, I must also possess the right to a reasonable means of my defense. This is just another way of saying that I possess the right to bear arms as a necessary component of the right of self-defense where arms just refers broadly to any means of reasonably initiating a self-protective action. What this all implies is that the right to bear arms is ultimately a natural extension of the right to life. The rights to life, self-defense, and arms are a package deal. Now, it's important that we focus on reasonable or prudent self-defense, for although self-protection is possible with a wide range of everyday objects, self-protective actions frequently occur in the context of significant physical disparities. Think about it. If you're a criminal bent on violent, violently victimizing an individual, you would want to select a target who you are capable of overpowering and exploiting. So, in delineating the right, the scope of the right to bear arms, we must pay careful attention to tools that are, that are especially well suited uh, towards equalizing disparities that are commonly exploited in violent crimes. Since the point of the right of self-defense is to protect one's life, and since one cannot protect one's life without a reliable, effective, and proportionate means of doing so, the right to self-defense must guarantee the right to a reasonable means of self-defense. What's more, the right to self-defense must guarantee us the right uh, to a reasonable means of lethal self-defense. For many criminal attacks involve the threat of grievous bodily harm or death. 
there would be no point in having the right to self-defense if it didn't guarantee us a fighting chance at protecting our life. Now, a reasonable means of self-defense is one that's able to reliably, effectively, and practically deliver a proportionate amount of force in response to a threat of harm. Guns seem to clearly fit this description. They don't require great skill to handle and can be effectively used by all sorts of individuals to equalize physical disparities with ease. And this isn't just baseless speculation either. There is overwhelming agreement within the empirical literature that guns are extremely effective in self-defense and are frequently used for this purpose. A 1993 study published in the Journal of Quantitative Criminology found that out of eight different forms of robbery resistance, gun, victim gun use was a resistance strategy most strongly and consistently associated with successful outcomes for robbery victims. A 2000 study published in the Journal of Criminal Justice found that men and women who resisted with a gun were less likely to be injured or lose property than those who resisted using some other means or who did not resist at all. In the case of women, having a gun does really equalize a woman with a man. A 2004 study published in the journal Criminology found that out of 16 different forms of victim self-protection, a variety of forceful tactics, including resistance with a gun, appeared to have the strongest effects in reducing the risk of injury. Finally, a 2010 study published in Crime and Delinquency found that resistance with a gun decreased the, the odds of robbery and rape completion by 93% and 92% respectively. Taking stock of these points, the Institute of Medicine and National Research Council concluded in a 2003 review of the literature that, quote, studies that directly assess the effect of actual defensive uses of guns have found consistently lower injury rates among gun-using crime victims compared with victims who use other self-protective strategies, end quote. Based on these considerations, it should be no surprise that guns are frequently used in self-defense. The findings of over 19 different surveys confirm the thesis that defensive gun uses are vastly more common than criminal uses. Let's recap. I have argued that our right to life entails a right to self-defense, and this right entails the right to a reasonable means of self-defense. Since guns are a reasonable means of self-defense, it follows that individuals have a moral right to own a gun. Now, one might object that this argument in defense of gun ownership I'm giving could be extended to artillery pieces, missiles, and nuclear weapons. Not so. Self-defense should be proportionate to the nature of the threat. So whether a weapon qualifies as a reasonable means of self-defense will depend on the kind of threats that one may reasonably expect to encounter within a functioning society. In contemporary America, individuals do not need patriot missiles in order to successfully defend themselves against aggression by other individuals. That being said, this observation is contingent on one's environment. Christians in the Middle East, who live under the constant threat of ISIS, are arguably entitled to the use of machine guns and RPGs, whereas ordinary Americans may not be. Now, I have argued that there is a moral right to own firearms that's grounded in the right of self-defense. But how strong is this right? Many proponents of gun control cite studies purporting to show that gun ownership leads to more crime. The implication is supposed to be that the right to own a gun is either overridden or defeated by empirical considerations. In response, critics of gun control cite studies showing that gun ownership does not increase crime and that it may even decrease it. As a result, both sides constantly squabble over the findings of this or that empirical study in this or that country. Now, these are interesting issues to be sure, and perhaps we can talk about them in a discussion period, but I'm not going to wade into them right now. I'm, I'm fine for now for granting, for the sake of argument, that gun ownership leads to more overall crime. I want to argue that even if widespread gun ownership did lead to more crime, that the right to own a gun would not be defeated. And how could this be? Well, begin by observing that fundamental moral rights are not subject to balancing tests. Your right to life isn't dependent on whether you're respecting your right to life would yield the best set of consequences. It is absolute and unrelenting, even if it be more beneficial that it be violated. For example, it would be wrong for a surgeon to override your right to life in order to harvest your organs to save five people, even if doing so, in doing so he pre produces a more beneficial outcome. It would be wrong for me to push an innocent fat man in front of a speeding train, even if that fat man's death resulted in 10 lives being saved. What these examples show is that the right to life has fundamental moral weight that cannot be overridden just because it would produce a greater good. 
we can think of the right to self-defense in similar terms. Since our right to life cannot be ordinarily overridden in the name of the greater good, and since the goal of self-defense is to protect one's life, it stands to reason that our right to self-defense also cannot be overridden in the name of the greater good. The right of self-defense shares in the strength of the right to life insofar as it is derived from it. Here's another way of looking at it. The right to life has supreme weight over other rights in that violations of this right are non-recoverable. If somebody violates your right to free expression or property, there's always a possibility of recovery and compensation. Not so with the violation of the right to life, for one cannot recover from death. Because of this, the right to life must always take precedence over consequences and other com competing rights claims. Accordingly, the right of self-defense must carry equivalent weight or near equivalent weight to the right to life, for it protects something that, if lost, cannot be regained. Now, since the right to a reasonable means of self-defense is entailed by the right of self-defense, it must possess equivalent scope and strength with it, meaning that it, too, isn't subject to an ordinary cost-benefit analysis. Since the right to own a gun is an instance of this right, it follows that the right to own a gun for self-defense also cannot be overridden by a mere cost-benefit analysis. If the organ donation examples and fat man examples work, then the harms would have to be at least many times greater than the benefits for us to consider restrictive gun control. But this scenario does not hold even if we make the most generous empirical assumptions in favor of the pro-control side. This is not to say that statistics don't matter at all. Rather, the point is that they are not decisive in themselves. Moral rights, especially fundamental moral rights, are by their very nature supposed to resist appeals to negative utility. Another important point is that the kind of statistics we should be looking at are not those pertaining to the effects of guns in deterring crime, but those pertaining to the effects of guns in resisting crime. This is because the question of whether there exists the right to own guns for self-defense hinges chiefly on the question of whether guns are in fact an effective, reliable, and proportionate means of defending ourselves against an attack. Now, as we have seen, both common sense and the actual empirical evidence seems to testify the, to the fact that guns are an effective, reliable, and proportionate means of self-defense. One hardly even needs a study to confirm such a blindingly obvious thesis. Now, one might object that determining whether something counts as an effective, reliable, and proportionate means of self-defense requires taking into account uh, its larger ecological effects, not just its immediate effects in warding off an attack. Thus, if guns do in fact increase crime, then guns are not a reasonable means of self-defense. But this objection confuses the odds of being the subject of a victimization attempt with the odds of successfully defending against such a victimization attempt. Self-defense is fundamentally about resisting an attack. So whether something is a reasonable means of self-defense depends chiefly on whether it is an effective, reliable, and proportionate means of fending off a criminal attack. That something may increase one's chances of being the subject of a victim victimization attempt in general does not mean that it is not a reasonable means of fending off an attempt should one occur. Thus, permissive gun laws may still be socially beneficial even if they increase crime. Suppose that a permissive gun law increased the odds of attempted firearm victimization, but also dramatically increased one's chances of successfully resisting all kinds of criminal victimization attempts. In that case, we could reasonably judge such a law to be overall beneficial on account that one's increased risk to firearm victimization is outweighed by the dramatically increased likelihood of successful resistance across all categories of crime. So it's time to wrap things up. I've defended two basic contentions in tonight's discussion. First, there is a moral right to own a gun. Second, this moral right is not overridden by the empirical evidence. Taken together, these points seem to generate a very strong case for legalizing um, private gun ownership. Now, the scope of these uh, gun regulations, the scope of gun control, is not something I have room for. It's something that I hope to explore in a discussion period. And with that, I rest my case. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, many thanks to, to Swan and for, for Tim uh, for organising this wonderful de debate, dialogue, discussion. Um, 
and, and a particular thanks for Tim for giving such a clear articulation of, of the, the case for a right to own firearms. I think that's like, it's really useful to have a, ni a nice, clear, straightforward account of why, why we might believe that there's a moral right to own firearms. And so, and so I, I thank Tim, Tim for that. Um, Swan, I will preface my comments by saying Swan was being entirely too generous when he described me as an expert uh, in um, moral rights to own guns. Um, this is a little far outside my professional competence, um, but it's an important enough issue that I thought I should come and uh, engage with Tim's, Tim's argument and hopefully we can, I'm going to present a, a kind of contrary view here and we can have a bit of a discussion about that as well. So um, two comments about Tim's discussion of the moral right to own guns. So first, I think when we talk about a right to own guns, um, talking about a right to own guns, in inverted commas, is a little too coarse-grained, right? Um, and it helps gun grabbers like me and gun nuts like Tim talk past one another in really unproductive ways, right? Uh, if we just talk about a right to own guns, we're missing this kind of real question, which is, whether individuals have a right to own particular kinds of firearms under particular sets of conditions, right? Because few people seriously claim that you, it should be impermissible to own any kind of gun under any circumstance, right? There's very few people who are coming for manual cycling long guns owned by ranchers, right, to fend off coyotes. The, the set of people who think that you don't have a right to own those kinds of guns is vanishingly small. Right? Likewise, few people endorse maximally permissive rights to gun ownership. Right? Automatic weapons for children, felons, even liberals like me. Right? Like, no one is on the side, like very few people are on the side of like, maximally permissive gun laws. So the real disagreement is over the precise kinds of guns that we have a right to own and whether we have a right to do so free from background checks, licensing regimes, registration or safekeeping requirements. Um, and it's not clear to me at least that a comprehensive licensing scheme or universal background checks meaningfully impede the capacity to, for people to engage in self-defence. Um, in much the same way that you might think that uh, similar rules for using driving a car um, are not typically taken to impede one's right to freedom of movement. Okay? Um, so I'd like to hear Tim kind of give us an account of what restrictions he thinks are and are not compatible with the moral right to own a gun for self-defence. I need a little bit more specificity to see like exactly where this argument lies. Right. So second, and I, this is kind of a more fundamental kind of problem that I have with the argument, and that's that Tim argues that if there's a right to own a gun, it's by er virtue of that gun's status as a reasonable means to self-defence, um, which he claims straightforwardly follows from the right to not be, well, the right to life, he calls it, I might call it the right not to be killed. Um, but I think that's not quite right. Um, I think if gun ownership imposes some risks on third parties, then uh, it's reasonable to ask whether the right to... It's, all re it's reasonable to suggest that the right to gun ownership is going to hinge on whether guns are an effective means to self-defence relative to alternative methods of self-defence, like using pepper spray or a baseball bat, right? Um, and contrary to popular myth, um, the evidence is not so great on this score um, that, that guns are more effective at protecting an individual's life than other methods of self-defense. It's at least not very clear that guns are a more effective means than other methods, okay? So of course, um, Tim, lists a bunch of studies, he says that there's overwhelming agreement that guns are an extremely effective means for self-defence. Um, but I think we should be careful about these studies for, for two reasons. Um, first, these are not studies 
of the effect of guns on the ability to defend against lethal violence. All right? None of the studies involve self-defense against what you might call attempted homicide. Right? And most of them are analyses of resistance to robbery, right? uh, which is just defined in the data set as theft plus the use of force or the threat of use of force. Um, and it's not often clear in robbery cases that your right to life, as opposed to your right to your property or your wallet or your car or whatever, is actually threatened. Okay? So Tim doesn't argue that you have a right to, gun, right to a gun because you have a right to use or threaten potentially lethal violence to defend your property right? or to prevent minor injury from occurring to yourself in the case of like a simple assault down in Aggieville when people are drunk. Right? So the relevance of these studies to his argument is a little unclear to me, and I'd like it to be clarified. Right? And in any case, the 1993, 2000, 2004, and 2010 studies that he, that he discusses actually really fail to establish that a gun is more effective at preventing injury than many other kinds of weapons. Right? So blunt objects, chemical deterrence, etc. Indeed, um, and we can go one by one through them uh, if, if, we, if we have time in the questions, um, but to save time, take my word for that. Um, indeed, there's more recent studies of defensive gun use, such as a 2009 study um, by Hart and Mythe and a 2015 study by Hemingway and a 2018 RAND Corporation meta-analysis of all the previous research that shows that there is no statistically significant difference between defensive gun use and many other protective strategies, right? Including running away, using other weapons, or even calling the police, right? So in short, the evidence base for the claim that Tim requires, which is that guns are a more effective means to self-defense than other alternatives, is, I think, ambiguous at best. All right. So, then my comments on Tim's approach. How much time do I have left? Uh, two and a half minutes. <laughs> okay. So, here's the, here's the quick sketch of what I might call the public health approach. So, um, the public <laughs> health approach um, says, well, it starts from a, a few facts, right? It says, look, guns are involved in a lot of death and injury in the United States, including two-thirds of homicides and half of suicides, right? And the US has a lot more homicide than other developed nations, right? And most of that difference is firearm violence, right? So the rate of non-gun homicide in the US is only double that of the developed nation's average. But the firearm homicide rate is 25 times higher. And what you get out of that is a homicide rate overall that's seven times higher than the other developed nation average, OK? The third fact is that access to a firearm is statistically associated significantly <laughs> with a higher likelihood of both suicide and homicide victimization. So even after controlling for mental illness, arrest history, etc., merely owning a gun is associated with a higher likelihood of both suicide and, and being the victim of a homicide. Right. And lastly, and I think this is important, the poor people of colour and women are disproportionately victimised by gun violence, right? So homicide, most of it by firearm, is the leading cause of death for black men and women between 15 and 35, and likewise access to firearms in the home makes uh, it much more likely that someone's going to be killed or seriously injured in a domestic violence incident, okay? So those, the, the public health approach takes those facts and argues that just like our, other, our approach to other major causes of death and disease, we can introduce policies that reduce the burden of firearm injury and death. For instance, we've made great strides in lowering the rate of death and injury due to car accidents because of a suite of public health policies, seatbelt laws, young driver laws, higher car safety standards, safer roads, etc. And similarly, the public health approach asks whether there are evidence-based policies we could implement that would reduce the burden of death and injury due to guns. So to do, um, 
And so I think I will leave it there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and maybe I can talk a little bit more about the public health approach in questions. So that's not good. All right. Okay, so I'm sure there's plenty of questions. Um, let me begin by kind of describing how I'm going to format the conversation portion of this uh, of tonight's discussion. I'm going to start off with just a few questions from myself, and then about maybe halfway through, I want to let uh, both Dr. Harrington and Professor Shao kind of have some conversation themselves without me moderating necessarily. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, Professor Shao, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think Dr. Harrington makes a great point at the beginning by discussing, well, you know, we kind of have the general case about the moral right to gun ownership, mm -hmm. but what would you say are the reasonable limitations to that right that don't contradict it? Yeah, so there's this on. Yeah, so there's a lot I could say about, you know, the particular weapons, and I didn't have time in my opening speech to do that. I, I would say that the status quo right now, so basically, um, and it depends on which state, but pretty much any kind of uh, semi-automatic weapon is legal within, within, there are certain nuances, but I would draw the line when it comes to weapons at fully automatic weapons. So I don't think, I mean, I do think there are specific circumstances. So for example, let's say you live in the Middle East and your terrorist groups, you know, harassing your neighborhood. I think in that context, you might have a right to own an automatic weapon. But in the United States, I don't think that um, the right to own a gun extends to something like a bazooka, a machine gun, an Uzi, fully automatic. Um, now, currently, uh, and, and let me know if I'm taking too much time answering your questions. Uh, currently, under the National Firearms Act, you can get fully automatic weapons subject to ATF approval. And you need to get a tax stamp, uh, more stringent reg regulations, and I'd be, I'd be okay with that, provided that, so when it comes to more dangerous weapons, that they're regulated more, more stringently. So I, I don't think that um, we should treat all weapons equal. Some weapons, obviously, are more dangerous than others. And so I think there is a continuum to be drawn here when it comes to different kinds of weapons. All right. Uh, do you want to respond to that, Dr. Harrington? Uh, well, I, I guess I, I would ask a little bit about, like, other restrictions. So, so you know, I think my view on this is that there's a, there is entirely too much focus on the kind of gun uh, when we're talking about restrictions. Um, and the public health evidence here is kind of mixed about like whether or not wholesale bans on semi-automatics mm -hmm. would make a big difference. Um, in fact, it's kind of it's it's hard to know. I mean, um, given the vagaries of the data, what I think is kind of interesting is like the question of universal background checks. So. So currently in Kansas, I don't know whether any of you have ever sold a gun in Kansas, but like there's basically a don't ask, don't tell policy for private sales to Kansas residents, right? So federally, if you, if you knowingly send, sell a gun to a felon, right, that would be a crime. But if you simply just don't know <laughs> whether the guy that you're selling the gun to is a weapon, is a felon, sorry, uh, then you don't run afoul of the law, right? And I guess my, my, like, my opening view is we ought to close that loophole, right? Like the, that seems like a, an obvious loophole where uh, you, know, you, can, you can make big public health strides by tightening up access of felons to, uh, to guns through like a private sale system. Um, and let me let me also ask now a question to Dr. Harrington as well. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't seem as if you necessarily disagree with the claim that maybe there is a moral right to gun ownership. It seemed more like you were saying that it's just not helpful to say that we have this vague right when there's so many specifics. Does that seem to be a fair characterization of your side, or? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think um, you know, I'm I am hesitant to talk about moral rights in too much depth. I think like uh, a lot of these kind of very rights to particular objects or rights to particular kinds of um, activities um, are normally what we might think of as institutional rights, right? They're rights that are determined by how our political community is structured. Um, but bracketing off that worry, yeah, in broad strokes, I think you can say, look, you might have a right to own some kinds of guns under some kinds of circumstances. Um, 
but I think you don't have a right to the status quo that we have now, mm. which is um, right a right to own a gun without registration, without licensing, without any kind really without without many safe keeping requirements, um, I would argue that your rights to be free of those restrictions don't really extend very far. Yeah, I think it's fair to want to narrow the gun debate down because weapons don't exist, you know, all, it's not monolithic. Weapons exist on a continuum. So I think it's right to, I mean, obviously, you know, I may have the right to own a, you know, a double barrel shotgun, but that same right wouldn't justify my right to own a bazooka, for example. So I think it's, I think it's fair to want to narrow it down, and uh, that's, that's, that's something that I would, I would, you know, if I had more time, I would specifically outline what kind of proposals I favor, what kind of proposals I don't favor. Mm. So let me now bring the question, another question to you. So you base a lot of the argument on this idea of like a right to life, yeah. right? And it, it seems maybe intuitive that we do have a right to life. Um, but wouldn't it be the case that, let's say, based on, you know, uh, the harms that guns cause, mm -hmm. and that let's say this is widespread, so there's homicides in communities and so forth, instability, wouldn't this seem seemingly contradict that right to life if we don't have, let's say, conditions that properly allow that to flourish if we do have too permissive gun laws? Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't think there should be no gun controls at all. So when it, when it comes to guns, people often talk about, you know, the negatives of guns. But you also have to take into account that guns have a useful function in self-defense. So when it comes to regulating guns for self-defense, when it comes to respecting the right to life in general, we should take into account the fact that guns are used to take lives, but we should also take, in, should take into account the fact that guns are also used to save lives. And so um, I, I don't know if it's helpful to focus on one rather than the other. I think there should be some kind of, obviously, if we had, for example, more um, criminal uses of guns than defensive uses of guns, I think there would be room there for looking at gun policy and re revising what we have right now. But as it stands, I think, there's when it comes to the number of defensive gun uses each year, most studies show, most surveys about 2021 surveys show that there are between 760,000 to 3 million defensive gun uses each year compared to around 416,000 criminal uses. So right now, there seem to be more defensive gun uses than criminal uses. And so I think right now, on, it weighs in favor of the right to life. All right. So, um, yeah, and that kind of brings us back to kind of this, the, the, the statistical debate about, um, you know, what, where does the evidence exactly point? Um, you know, Dr. Harrington, I noticed that you kind of questioned the studies that uh, Professor Shao cited. So we can maybe get to that point. But don't you think that there's maybe a common sense case that maybe, uh, you know, even if the statistics don't really point decisively to one direction or the other, uh, doesn't there seem to be a common sense case for uh, Professor Shao's view? Yeah, I think um, so, so. So, if I can talk briefly, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to have a huge statistical debate because s debates about statistics in this kind of format are like <laughs> a bad idea. Um, we're not going to get very far, right? Like, you guys can't like look at the studies. That you don't have them in front of you. Like, um, I will say that when people talk about the number of defensive gun uses, um, I think we should acknowledge that there are people who dissent from the view that defensive gun use is as frequent as Tim suggests. Um, the studies that he's citing are ones which were conducted by a number of different groups, but they involve a particular survey methodology um, that some people reject. Other studies that use a different data set suggest that the number of defensive gun uses is actually really low, right, 15,000 a year, um, and in particular, legal defensive gun uses. So the number of gun uses that are self-reported as defensive um, in these kind of telephone surveys, but in fact, when you look at the, the particular circumstances may not have in fact been legal uses of a firearm, um, are a little bit concerning. Um, so I think like, I wanna just push out the boat and say, the number of defensive gun uses is in fact in dispute. Um, when we talk about the common sense view, I think that's right, right? There are, there are certainly going to be circumstances where having access to a firearm um, is the difference maker, right? Like there's gonna be these certain 
circumstances where your possession of a firearm and not some other weapon like made the difference in saving your life, right? Um, my, my point in talking about the statistics is to say that um, how frequent that is, right, um, is, is a matter of some dispute, right? And second, the ordinary cases in which people use guns or attempt to use guns, um, the data suggests that they wouldn't have been any better off um, in most of the cases where they used a gun to defend themselves from violence if they had used another weapon, right? Comment? Yeah. 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 So there is, there is controversy over the number of defensive gun uses, and most of the, the, the view that there are low defensive gun uses, uh, the source for that comes from the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is a government-run survey um, that looks at criminal victimization across the entire country. Now, people who use that study, like um, David Hemingway and others, find that, well, there are only about 60, 70,000 defensive gun uses each year. The problem with using the NCVS is that the NCVS wasn't designed to measure defensive gun use. Indeed, Respondents are never asked directly whether or not they used a gun for solid defense. They merely have the option to volunteer that information. So, of course, there's going to be an under-reporting issue. So, yeah, there is, there is controversy over the number of defensive gun uses. But I, when it comes to the, sources, the source for the low defensive gun use count, I don't know if the NCVS is more reliable to survey methods that specifically are designed to measure the amount of defensive gun uses. All, all of those surveys, all 20, 21 of them, including three done by the CDC, find that defensive gun uses are extremely, they're, they're more common at least than criminal uses. So it, it, is, it is controversial, but I would say the stronger evidence points toward there being more defensive gun uses. And the RAND survey that uh, Dr. Harrington pointed out, note, and Dr. Harrington says about, there, some, some surveys say about, or some methods say about 15,000, 16,000. The RAND survey, the RAND meta-analysis, finds that the NCVS uh, almost certainly, in their own words, quote, almost certainly underestimates the amount of defensive gun uses. So it's controversial, and I'll, I'll leave it at that, because I don't want to get into a statistical debate, because obviously, you know, you don't have the studies in front of you. You can't evaluate what I say. You, you just have to take my word for it. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, yeah, let's not touch this. It's, it's, it'll be, like, contribute to the net amount of boredom in the room. Um, uh, I'm going to just... I disagree with Tim about which one is okay. the right survey to use. So, um, I mean, one thing to say about this is once we're in a situation where we're talking about... Um, you know, so obviously I'm, I'm going to concede that there are lots of... that there are some cases where a gun is the difference maker, right? Um, but we're, we're in a situation where we need to ask ourselves, like, um, whether it's reasonable to have a gun for self-defence in the sense that is a gun a proportionate response to the kinds of threats that you're kind of, like, reasonably going to face, right? And the question is, like, how often are you going to be in a situation where you are threatened with lethal violence, right? And the th you could do something about that threat, right? And uh, a gun, rather than some other self-protective strategy, would make the difference, right? That's the, like, that's the incidence rate that we need. We need to know, like, how often is it the case that uh, you would find yourself in those kinds of situations, right? If we're going to justify a right to own guns according by, ver by virtue of self-defence, okay, and my my supposition is that actually, given the rate of violent crime in general, the number of times that you're going to find yourself in those and the specifics of how violent crimes occur, and in particular how homicides occur, the number of times that you're going to find yourself in those kinds of situations is vanishingly small, right? Yeah, uh, so what I would say is that it's, it's when, when we look at averages, it's, it's, it can be misleading because 
the benefits and negatives of whatever you think of are not usually evenly distributed. And if you live in a high-class neighborhood where it's a gated community, there are security guards, security cameras everywhere, you're probably not going to be the victim of a violent crime. Whereas if you live in a low-income neighborhood where there's a lot of racial tension, where there's other exacerbating factors, you, you are probably more likely to be the victim of a violent crime. So it's, it's I would say, a bit too, it's pinning too much of a broad, broad stroke to focus, you know, just with an abstraction what your odds of facing a violent crime are. You have to look at the specific context. And I think um, there's a stronger case to be made that those in certain socioeconomic conditions are at more risk uh, for being the victim of a violent crime. And for those people, they would have a stronger right to self-defense and a stronger right to own a gun. So um, we're about halfway through with the, uh, with the conversation portion. So right now, I'm going to let loose, and I'll let, uh, let maybe uh, Tim start by asking some questions to Dr. Harrington, and then we'll see where the conversation goes from there. Yeah, so great, great approach, the public health approach. Um, I do have a few questions, and I guess first would just be um, your, your, what, what's your actual view when it comes to what kind of firearms we can own and we can't own? You, you, you say it's... Uh, too, too coarse to speak of, you know, a right to own guns in general. And I'm just curious to know what guns you think we can own and what guns you think we cannot own. Oh, that's a difficult question. So um, this, is, this is where my, expert, my lack of expertise run, like, runs out, right? So I'm reluctant to take a very, like, precise position here because I just don't know enough about the data first and second of all, I don't think the data that we have is as complete as it could be, in part because of some uh, choices that the federal government has made around uh, the funding of firearm research. It's very difficult for federal, federal health funds to go towards firearm research. Um, but, like, if I'm going to push out the boat in, like, like without committing to too much, um, I would suggest that the real issue is how we regulate handguns, right? Handguns are the vast majority of homicides. They're the thing that makes the biggest difference when it comes to suicide, like suicide risk. Um, same thing with the domestic violence, uh, increased domestic violence risk. Um, and I think you there is a kind of prima facie case for banning handguns, uh, particularly high-capacity semi-automatic handguns, um, because the, of the data on self, the data on self-defense and their like the the capacity of these kinds of guns to increase your capacity to defend yourself is kind of weak, right? So we have all these handguns running around that really, it seems like, don't make a statistical difference with respect to people's ability to defend themselves. But they do kill an awful lot of people, right? Particularly people of colour and women. And, and so handguns are like the big question, right? Like, what do we do about those? It's not, it's not the big, like... In part, it's not the AR-15s and semi-automatic like, rifles that get a lot of attention. I think like they're not the big public health problem. They're a problem for a very particular kind of like event, right? So handguns. Let's okay. let for argument's sake, let's ban handguns, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, and just quick follow-up. So, um, so you 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 would, for the sake of argument, support banning handguns. Right. What guns do you think we can be allowed to own? If, if not handguns, what other, what can we own? Or maybe no guns in general? So I think, I think it it's, should certainly be permissible to own, like, manual cycling long guns, right? Sh certain kinds of shotguns, right? Um, you know, I, I have no problem with people owning those kinds of guns. The, but the, the kind of gun question is, is in some sense... Um, you know, you've also got to think about the kind of regime of licensing around those guns and the, the regime of 
like, do we have permit to purchase laws that require people to have an affirmative like background clearance before to make sure that they comply with the nice federal list of like no felons, no misdemeanor, domestic violence, no mental health orders, right? Um, do we have those kinds of laws in place? If we do, it looks like the public health data, the public health data looks like it, it suggests that that makes a big difference, right? Um, so yeah, manual cycling long gun, like, like if people want to hunt, right? Uh, or they want to own a vintage M1 Garand, right? Or they want to own, um, well, I guess an M1 Garand is semi-automatic, but... Um, it's a rifle. It's a rifle, <laughs> right? It's a long gun. The, the real issue for me is handguns, not long guns. You have a question for me? Oh, yeah, awesome. So, um, so one question I had, and this is about that kind of argument, is... so. Do you think felons have a right to own a gun? So, so the self and the reason I ask this is the self-defense argument. Like we typically don't think that felons give up their right to self-defense outside of the context in which they initially offend, right? So, like you go to jail, right, uh, and then you're released. You pay your debt to society. Um, we typically think that you have a right to self-defense at that point. Um, but we don't allow people to own guns. So do, do you have like a, a position on that or? Yeah, I don't think felons should be allowed to own guns because felons have at least, I mean, it, felonies are a broad stroke, but I would say that, you well, know. Well, violent felons. Ve violent felonies, violent felonies. Okay, so I'd say that violent felons have demonstrated that they're not capable of, uh, I mean, they're, they're more likely to pose a risk to other people. And so giving them a gun would be counterproductive in a sense that it wouldn't facilitate their defense. It would facilitate um, um, a harmful use. So felons have done something to forfeit their gun rights. So they, they don't forfeit their right to self-defense in general. They forfeit their right to a particular means of self-defense. I don't, I don't think even felons forfeit their right to self-defense. Even felons, they remain human beings. They possess the right to life. And so criminals don't forfeit all their rights. They forfeit some of their rights. And so I would say felons, violent felons in particular, um, don't have the right to own a gun, at least... Um, at least, yeah, I, I would leave it there. Felons don't have the right to own a gun. Violent felons. So, I mean, I, 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 find, I, find, that a, I find it a little bit puzzling. The, the, the reason why is that, um, you know, you, you, make, you make this case um, that, that the right to life is absolute and self-defense rights by virtue of their connection to the right to life are absolute and by virtue of its connection as an effective means to self-defense, gun rights are also absolutes, right? Yeah, well, I, I don't think gun rights are absolute. I don't think gun rights are entailed by the right to bear arms. I think gun rights are one way of exercising that right. So uh, rights that are entailed by other rights, I, I, would, I would agree, they're not able to be forfeited. But I wouldn't say, because the idea of, you know, a basic, fundamental, natural right to own a gun, that... I wouldn't say that we have that kind of right because guns are obviously instruments or things we invent. You know, would we have a right to gun? You know, would, would, would it follow if we had a natural right to own a gun, it would follow that people back before guns were invented had a right to own a gun? That, that wouldn't make sense. So I think guns are the, the connection between self defense and gun, gun ownership, is uh, a contingent one, contingent on, you know, whether guns actually do the thing they're supposed to do. Okay. So, so one thing to say is, if, it, if it's if it's there, if it's contingent, right, on the if it's contingent on whether or not uh, giving that person a gun would in fact be uh, likely to increase the risk to other people, right? So it's the way that you disqualify. Well, I, I don't guns, know if I would right? say the risk to other people. I would say if they could use it in a way that would defend themselves and not. Um, unnecessarily put other people at harm. Right. So but so felons get disqualified because for some that they've proven in some sense that they they can 
that they can use weapons uh, to yeah, harm. I, I would say there was a presumption of maleficence on part of felons. <laughs> right. Uh, but isn't there like a presumption of like incompetence with respect to most people with respect to guns? So like if you put a handgun in my hand, I've never touched a gun in my life, right? I come from Australia, like a famously disarmed, <laughs> like unfree, like <laughs> hellscape. Um, <laughs> Like, it would be a bad idea for me to, like, be handed a gun right now, right? Like, I'd be very likely to harm someone else, right? So, so why not, like, why not suggest that people ought to be licensed, right? So if, you, if we think that felons pose a danger and that's a reason to, like, disqualify them, mm -hmm. well, then there's lots of people who are, in fact, incompetent, right, uh, with respect to firearm usage. And, in fact, like, maybe, like we do with cars, we should like require them to like demonstrate that they can operate a, f a gun safely. Yeah. So two things. First, I'm I'm not sure that there is a presumption of um, just being completely you, you know unable, clueless to use a gun. I, you know, if you put a gun in front of me, or I guess well, I guess I'm probably not a good example because I I've shot guns before. But uh, you know, if you put a gun in front of somebody, I don't think they're gonna you know be like, oh no, a gun, and then. A minute later, they shoot themselves, right? I, I think you know, it it, it takes it takes a, with with modern handguns, it takes a lot to misuse a gun. I mean, obviously, if you're poor, if you're poorly, uh, you know, if, if you're impulsive, for example, then maybe maybe I shouldn't put a gun in front of you. But for most people, if you put a gun in front of them and they have not, they know nothing about guns, they're not going to end up shooting themselves. I mean, if they if they, I mean, maybe if they have absolutely, if they've never ever heard of a gun, maybe if maybe they're like you know. Uh, you took somebody from the past into the future. They'd know any, nothing about a gun. Maybe then they'd hurt themselves. But we all know enough about guns to know that guns are things that you don't play with. And so I don't, I don't know if there would be a presumption uh, that people are just completely clueless when it comes to using guns. So uh, that's the first point. The second point is that, in principle, I don't have a problem with something like licensing for concealed handguns. What I do have a problem with are licensing systems that require people to demonstrate a special need to own a handgun. So, for example, in New Jersey, in California, you need to justify a special need to own a handgun. And that kind of law, I would say, those, ki those kinds of laws presume that your right to own a gun is overridden until proven otherwise. And I think that at the very minimum, we would say that each individual has at least a prima facie right to own a gun, and you can't just presume that prima facie right to own a gun to be overridden without some disqualifying evidence. And, and there's a lot more I could say, but I don't want to take up the time. Yeah. Awesome. Do you want to ask me another oh, question? Oh, yeah. So, um, so I'm curious about... Uh, so. This is sort of piggybacking on uh, what I said earlier about my question to you. So, you so the, the topic of this discussion debate is um, you know, the moral right to gun ownership. So, strictly speaking, you would say that there is a moral right to gun ownership, but only for spe specific classes of guns. Just as a point of clarification. <laughs> I mean, uh, again, I'm a little bit. Uh, I find the idea of moral rights uh, with respect to like these complex kind of like these complex social phenomena or technologies kind of suspect, right? But like, if I was gonna suggest, yes, yeah, like you know, if I had to suggest that it was a kind of moral right, um, I would suggest yes, you have a moral right, but it's like deeply kind of qualified, right? Like we need to specify very clearly what the moral right requires, just like we do with free speech, right? So it's not like the right to free speech is a right is a moral right to say whatever you want, right? Like we have like a list of qualifications that we apply to the moral right to free speech, right? So you're not allowed to, like, it's not, a, you don't have a moral right to, like, spread false defamatory information about other people, right? Like, no one thinks that's a moral right. No one thinks you have a moral right to, like, cry, there's a bomb in here, right? Like, no one thinks you have a moral right to do all sorts of different things, right? So I think when we just think, when we think about guns, yeah, we, maybe there is a moral right, but it's one that's, like, relatively tightly specified, right? And the real 
like question that we all as a like society have to answer is like how like permissive okay. uh, is the like are the conditions under which right. we can write. So, so to pick up on that, so let's suppose you're right in that on average individuals tend to uh, are not are not gun, guns are counterproductive on average. Yeah. Now it may be the case that guns are counterproductive on average, but there still remain some individuals for whom gun ownership specifically handgun ownership, would prove beneficial. Mm, yeah, good. What would you say about those, that, say, minority of people uh, for which gun ownership would actually benefit them? What, what should their options be when it comes to owning a handgun? So, so maybe there is this set of people uh, who are in a particular set of circumstances such that they really do have a moral right to own a handgun and they shouldn't really have to ask anyone about that, right? Like... The problem is that their right is in tension with other people's rights. So it's like when we talk about the social costs of gun ownership, it's not just that, like, it, these social costs aren't, like, sitting out in the ether. They're harms to particular individuals, and I think it's reasonable to think of those as, like, rights violations, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sketch to, to, to see what I mean in the context of self-defence, for instance, right? So... Um, when we think about a right to self-defence, right, which we all have, right, I wouldn't talk about it as a right to use force. I talk about it as a right to um, a right to uh, not have anyone interfere with your capacity to avoid death or injury um, in the event that you're attacked, right. Um, and there's two ways you could interfere with someone's capacity to avoid death or injury, or at least two ways in the event that they're attacked. One is you could deprive them of a, of a gun, like an effective means to defend themselves against the attack. Another is that you could make their attackers' attacks more lethal, right, by, by like, giving them handguns, <laughs> OK? And the, so the, the way that we talk about guns with, like, rights, the rights of gun owners the good guys on the one hand, and then this like amorphous kind of notion of social costs on the other underplays the sense in which the wide availability of guns like might actually in fact violate the self-defence rights of vulnerable people. And with that, um, I'll now open up the floor for audience Q&A. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and uh, try to speak as loudly as you can so I can hear it and uh, kind of repeat the question back to the microphones. Not all at once now. <laughs> well, is there somebody in the back? Well, let's go with the gun. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned you've never fired or touched a firearm. Yeah. Would you like to? <laughs> I will take to the range and teach you if you'd like to. So, hey, have you had the opportunity to learn? So have so, you had the opportunity to learn how to fire a firearm? Uh, yeah, so there was also an offer in there, Swan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll pay for by me. <laughs> so, so, um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, so the answer, it, the answer is yes. Um, uh, I would actually like to, like, learn how to use a firearm, um, in part because I live in a, in a state with lots of firearms, right? And so I'd <laughs> like to know how to, like, to render one safe, right? If I came across one, like would, I, I have a small daughter, you know, I might come across one at their playmate's house or whatever, right? Um, the, the more practical question is, if you're a student, uh, there's like this gift relationship problem that like faculty are not allowed to accept. <laughs> it's a good thing that Mark here is not a student. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. okay. Well, yeah, Mark and I can talk. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> But maybe I can just pay to like come down to the range and uh, get a lesson from you guys. All right. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about like what's proportionate to the threat, or, like what sort of means proportionate to the threat. Um, something we didn't really talk about. Um, so should the threat of a tyrannical government, which I think is like if you look at history, could all could become a threat at any point, should that like how should that affect this conversation? All right. So how should uh, the proportionality of perhaps a tyrannical government affect this conversation. Uh, uh, I'll let Tim go with yeah. that one first. 
so we should all we should take into account the the risk that the government will violate the social contract. So if you look at just the history of state sanctioned citizen slaughter in the 20th century, a lot of people when a government goes bad, it goes really bad. And a lot of people are killed. So I think there is um definitely a presumption here in favor and and, and you know maybe people make the argument that well, you and your AR15, how are you going to stand against the government with their tanks and jet planes and missiles? Well, you can think of an armed citizenry as raising the costs of a government going bad in the same way that you wore a seatbelt, for example. A seatbelt, if you get into a horrific car accident, a seatbelt's not going to save you, but it's going to, it's going to make your chances of survival more likely. And so I would say in response to the tyrannical government argument that having, you know, an armed citizenry, you know, that, that might very well raise the cost of a government going bad and make them more reticent to do so. So I, I think there is something to be said in favor of the uh, tyrannical government argument from self-defense. Yeah, so, you know, this is an argument that, um, that people are pretty attracted to. I, I mean, I think, you know, one of the one of the things that, like the fundamental things that we do when we enter into a social contract, uh, when we kind of agree to abide by a system of rights and rules um, to live together is sometimes to, like there has to be some kind of mechanism by which violence between one another is constrained, right? Um, now, if um, private ownership of AR-15s, right, uh, with, I mean, AR-15s are like the bugbear, like everyone knows what they are, but like semi-automatic long guns, right, like things that have like utility in war, right, um, if those, uh, if private ownership of those is compatible with like constraining, uh, constraining a lot of, like if it doesn't have a large amount, a large externality, like a lot of violence, like associated with it. Um, and if, in fact, there are things like safe storage requirements, right? So one of the things that I think is compatible with owning guns in order to resist tyranny is to have really stringent safe storage requirements, right? So keeping ammunition stored separately from uh, the the firearm, right? Having Trigger locks, no one likes trigger locks if you like own a gun, but like those are things are, ro are maybe roadblocks to self defense, but it doesn't seem like they're roadblocks in quite the same way to, uh, to owning a gun in order to resist tyranny, which is a kind of longer term. Like it's not like the, it's not like in general the jackboots are going to come to your house and you're going to have like two minutes to, to prepare, right? Like there's going to be time as the, the country disintegrates, right, for you to, like, take preparations. Um, maybe if I could also add one thing in. Um, when this argument is raised about tyrannical governments, a lot of people say, well, this is the United States. We're not the Soviet Union. We're not like these other crazy nations out there. So it's not really reasonable to say that it could happen here. Uh, what, what would you say in response to that? Well, there has been one rather large event in history in which we violated the rights of minorities, um, slavery, namely. So it's not inconceivable that something like that on that scale could happen again in the future. I mean, the problem is that we just don't know enough about, you know, geopolitical affairs to make an assured uh, prediction that things will never go bad. I mean, what, what's going to happen 100 years from now? I can't give you an answer. I don't know what the government would be like 100 years from now. Maybe we'll still be around. Maybe we'll be completely upside down. I don't know. And so I think there is, there is value to be had in having you know, that kind of insurance against um, a government that goes wrong. Yeah. And, and maybe to also Dr. Harrington, uh, maybe taking a utilitarian spirit. So <laughs> I think you were talking about, you know, at least you'd be willing to ban handguns, but not long guns and shotguns and so forth. Right. But it seems as if they can inflict, those, those, the, hand, uh, the, the long guns and the shotguns can inflict more damage. So maybe handguns are just the better, the lesser of two evils that could be before us. So... Um, the, I mean, the problem with handguns is that they're just they're they're the ones that are easy to carry, right? Uh, and they're easy to conceal, 
and they're like associated with the vast majority of like firearm homicides, right? So like it's, I mean, talking about like the relative power of a particular weapon, right? Um, you know, when from a public health perspective, we don't like really care about the the particular like capacities of the weapon. What we care about are the like effects that that weapon has out in the in the community, right? Uh, and handguns are the things that like make the biggest difference in the United States. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, even though we have these, you know, these shootings that carry a lot of like media attention, it's not necessarily things like AR-15s and, and long guns, right? It's, uh, it's handguns. Um, one thing to say about this tail risk, the, uh, the worry about tyranny just is that you're making a kind of trade-off there between like this long, this, this risk that of things going really badly, right? The government becoming this tyranny. You're making a trade-off between ensuring against that risk, potentially, and like raising your everyday risk slightly, right? So there's like a genuine trade-off there. And I don't like have a fixed view about how you ought to like make that trade-off, right? Um, but you should recognise that if it's the case that like, owning certain kinds of weapons raises the everyday risk of victimisation or violence, then you're making a trade-off about like, what you're most likely to have happen to you versus like, this extreme but really catastrophic risk. Right. All right, let me get another question. All right. um, yeah, my question was going back to something actually Dr. Harrington said that kind of relates to banning handguns. So I know you had mentioned that if we're looking at risk um, and providing people the ability to defend themselves, then we're not, we shouldn't only be looking at how someone can defend themselves with a weapon, but also what's in the hands of the perpetrator against them. So it, is it really a matter at this point of saying, sort of weighing the risk of like, okay, if there's more handguns in society, there's more opportunity for perpetrators to use it versus more handguns offering more ability to protect yourself. So do you see what my question is? like? protection versus perpetration? Yeah, so, so one thing that you should always like keep in mind when you think about like what the, what the appropriate response to a public health problem is, is are, are your interventions gonna work, <laughs> right? So like the kind of common complaint is if you know, we ban handguns, well that's gonna take guns out of the hands of the good guys, right? And that'll just disarm all these people and the felons will keep their guns, right? Um, I mean, one thing to say about that is, uh, like, the economics of, like, criminal gun use are really important here. So, like, once you ban something, depending on the kind of thing it is, that can really change how easily accessible it is, right? And that's my, what you might care about, right? So, like, like most most criminal uses of handguns, the handgun, like, doesn't hang around, <laughs> right? Like, it gets, it gets ditched um, because it's a p big piece of evidence, right, linking you to the crime. Um, and so, like, there's the... Part of what makes that, like, viable if you're a criminal enterprise is that there's, like, another gun easily available for, like, 800 bucks, right? Um, so yeah, I take I, I I take that seriously. I think that's an issue that we need to think about. Like, what will this be? Just like prohibition, right? Where like it all just went underground, but people drank almost as much as they did before, right? Or will it have like a because it's a durable good that takes some special skill to make and like involves like some pretty sophisticated machining and things like that? Will it have an impact on the trade, right? That's a complex question, right? Like, but I think it's a good one, yeah. All right, let me uh, see if there's another one uh, right there in the red shirt. Yeah, so most of what you guys talked about was, you know, your moral right in relationship to self-defense. What would be, or is there a moral right to uh, having a firearm for purposes of hunting or uh, sport? So beyond just self-defense rights, you know, is there another kind of right to just have it for hunting or recreational activities? I would say there's a prima facie right. I would not say that right is as strong as the right to own a gun for self-defense. So uh, if all we're looking at is hunting, 
Uh, do I have a right to own a gun for hunting? Yeah, you have you have a defeasible right, but if but that right can be defeated by more you know important considerations. So if all we're looking at is just the right to own a gun for hunting, I think that right there is a right to own a gun for or a, at least a defeasible right to own a gun for hunting. But I think that right would pale in consideration to it wouldn't be as important as self defense and the all the negative harms of gun ownership would seem to me, if all we're focusing on is the right to hunt using a gun, that would seem to outweigh the right to hunt with a gun. So I think the better approach is to focus on self-defense because you can, you don't have to hunt with a gun. You can hunt with a bow and arrow, crossbow, whatever. And so there, so I guess my point would be, yeah, there is a right to own a gun for hunting, but it's not that strong. It's not as strong as self-defense. All right, um, right in the middle. So earlier in your opening statement, you said that um, there's some cases where it's right to have a gun for self-defense, right? Okay, but now you want to ban handguns, so are we going to be carrying around 30-30s for self-defense, or what do you reckon? Because a handgun is a self-defense okay. gun. So if we don't have handguns, then what's the next alternative gun that we'd be carrying around? <laughs> um, well, sawn off shotguns, obviously, right? <laughs> um, no, I mean, so when I said that, like, there might be some cases where you you genuinely do seem like you have a strong prima facie right to own a to own a gun for self defence, um, I think a handgun is probably the most appropriate gun, right? Um, in those cases, but my my claim was those cases are like a small enough subset. Um, of people who genuinely are at such significant risk that they require a gun uh, to defend themselves as opposed to some other weapon. Um, that, and that they're not, for instance, defending their home, uh, in which case often things like long guns are like almost as useful. Right? Um, in those cases, I think what we need to say is yeah, like maybe those people's rights are not being respected, but we're trading off those people's rights against other people's rights to be free from uh, criminal victimisation or victimisation at the hands of intimate partners that's really lethal, right? So one of the things, like the thing, like when Tim was talking about the crime, the crime data, the link between guns and crime, and like... I don't know whether guns increase crime in the United States, like violent crime in the United States is roughly on a par with where it is in other developed nations, right? Um, but the lethality of violent crime in the United States is like way higher, right? So I don't, I don't, I don't have a particular gun that we ought to replace there. I think like there's a trade-off we've got to make between the rights of these people who genuinely need a handgun to defend themselves and the rights of other people, right, to be free from really lethal violence. All right, anyone else? Uh, let's get the, uh, the one in the glasses. So in the context of worries about a government that may have um, less than benign intentions along the lines of her question, so I'm interested in the possible existence of like an intentional and institutionalized set of oppression and, and discrimination against the groups of people, like certain racial groups or certain sex groups or certain socioeconomic groups of people. So um, you mentioned that getting federal funding to support research about gun violence is hard. And so given that, and that gun violence is disproportionately felt by those three groups of people, is there any, is, is the existence of those two things possible support for the fact, or possible for support for worries about systems of, con of intentional continued oppression. All right, so since that is a kind of a complex question, I'll just ask that the speakers kind of re-articulate how they understood it and then answer it from there. So I think the question was directed towards Dr. Herring. Yeah, sure. So, um, so yeah, so it's a good question, right? Like, I think one of the things that you want to, like, think about when you think about self-defense gun use is that um, there's this worry that what we're doing when we allow wide availability of guns, particular handguns, um, is that we're transferring risk 
from one set of people who are already actually pretty well off to another set of people, right? So handgun, self-defense, hand, like allowing people to own handguns for self-defense might in fact reduce the risk the rare, the rare, on the rare occasion that someone who's pretty well off finds themselves in a violent encounter. But it like massively increases the risk uh, well, not massively, I shouldn't make those kind of claims, but it increases the risk, right, that, that much we know, um, for people in poor neighbourhoods, right, people, uh, women in particular in domestic violence situations, right, like the evidence is pretty strong there that if there's a gun in the household, the, like, the rate of violent, the rate of serious injury and death from domestic violence situations increases quite dramatically. Right, um, and so yeah, there's this worry that not not necessarily that it's an intentional oppression, but that that but that we're ignoring the extent to which like our gun policy might contribute to existing inequalities or existing ways in which some people within society are like um, having like a disproportionate amount of social risk allocated to them, right? Yeah. Um, let's see, any other questions? I think the gentleman in the blue. Um, do you think, um, Professor Harrington, do you think that the, um, th the threat of an armed citizenry has deterred the US government from acting in a semi-tyrannical um, way? For example, um, FDR issued an order during the Great Depression which confiscated large amounts of um, gold from private citizens. Um, do you think that he would have, and he was also our longest standing president and probably would have ran for a fifth term if he hadn't died. Do you think that an armed citizenry has deterred um, regimes such as his from overstepping? So has an armed citizenry deterred tyrannical government in the past? Um, my view is probably not. Um, so, like, think about the, like, Japanese internment, right? Like... <laughs> Like this huge like rights violation that the like that the government perpetrated on a like a class of undesirable citizens, right? Like, did an armed citizenry deter the government from doing that? Uh, no, they did it anyway, right? Like, um, you know, I mean, it's hard, right? Because this is like a counterfactual, right? Like, do we? How do we know how history would have gone if? there were fewer automatic weapons during the Depression, right? Or, like, how do we know history? But my sense is that the government, uh, in general, um, that my sense is that, uh, that an armed citizenry hasn't been the difference maker, right, for lots of the kind of historical events that we've had, right, or preventing the the American government from going one step too far. And that's in part because there's like, I'd be interested in everyone who knows of any like historical like records that suggest that like the government discussed doing something really heinous, but was like, well, we can't do that because like those folks have the guns, right? Um, you know, but yeah, I don't know, I think it's an interesting question. I don't know whether Tim has a thought about that. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with Dr. Harrington that it's difficult to assess a historical counterfactual like that. I would point towards smaller, so I don't have any, I don't know definitively whether a tyrannical regime has been, has been deterred by firearms. I can point to smaller level cases where government authorities were, were deterred from uh, certain kinds of actions. So, for example, the Bundy Ranch standoff. You know, you'd a bunch of armed citizens come out, challenge the Bureau of Land Management. They backed off. You know, that that might be one, you know, one case where you had an armed citizenry fend off government on a small scale. Now, whether or not that can be iterated to the large scale, I don't know. But certainly, there are small, and there's there there are other cases. I don't have them off the top of my head, but there are small small scale cases where um, government actors, forces, have been deterred by, you know, a militia forming up or an armed posse forming up and saying, no, you can't, you can't encroach on our territory or whatnot. All right, I'm, I'm trying to also be sensitive to people who've had their hands up the longest time. So um, if you've had your hand up for a long time, just kind of make it, make yourself more noticeable. 
Okay, sir in the black. So uh, to Mr. Uh, Harrington, you, you talk about licensing for okay. individuals to have firearms. But given given the fact that, uh, roughly speaking, we'll use general round terms, uh, the number of deaths by violent violence uh, overall is roughly 10 to 10 to 12,000 in 2016, and the number of deaths from alcohol-related car accidents mm -hmm. is about 10,000, yeah. given in 10, uh, 2016. How would licensing change that one way or the other? Well, I mean, I think the thing to, to think about is the counterfactual, <laughs> which is what it was like before we started, like, seriously enforcing DUI limits, right? Um, so, like, you know, I'm sympathetic to this worry, right? Like, you know, like, Colon cancer kills a lot more people than firearms, right? Like, and traffic accidents kill, I don't actually know, but they kill at least as many people as firearms, right? Does anybody know whether that's true? I think it's true. It's roughly, it's on a par, right? Like, it's close, at least, or maybe it's way more, right? It's double, good, okay. So, um, so I think the thing to say here is, like, We've done an awful lot to reduce traffic fatalities over the last like several decades, right? In part because we have things like um, the thing that's made the big biggest difference, for instance, is graduated licensing laws, like really strict restrictions on some classes of young drivers, right? About how they like can drive, right? Um, the other thing that's made a big difference is DUI and like speed enforcement, right? And so the, when we look at the number of deaths, the question is, like, could we... Like, if we could prevent a death through a licensing regime, um, is that, like... Or if we could prevent many deaths through a licensing regime, would that be a reasonable response? Um, not looking too carefully about the relative number of deaths um, relative to other diseases, I think, right? Like what you might want to, where you might want to worry about there is how much money we put towards like traffic accident control versus firearm prevention, right? Because the relative number of deaths are going to matter there, right? So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so le is there anybody else, uh, sir, in the gra glasses? Um, I don't know how the best way to win this. Um, in regards to, you, you talked about a ban. Uh, I would think that would imply, in the way you were, maybe a uh, buyback or a uh, oh, yeah. um, or a confiscation, possibly. Or is, are you specifically pointing to buyback? I mentioned you were Australian. Yeah, yeah right. So, so um, I, I, it's hard to compare them uh, culturally, but if you're talking about from America, coming from perspective where we've had a Second Amendment for yeah, yeah. 240 years. Um, is there an implication that if you were to overreach on that, it, it, where people saw that you, uh, individual <coughs> federal government that was overreaching that, uh, and there was retaliation, uh, is that a, a fear that comes to mind? So I think there are two questions in there. There's one about uh, buyback programs, or maybe is you know Harrington suggesting confiscation, and the second question is kind of the cultural differences between different nations, especially with America kind of being the 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 the, the different one in the room. Yeah. So, oh my God. So this is why I didn't want to like talk about <laughs> like my particular view about this because, and I said like for the sake of argument, let's ban handguns. But I'm not like, you know, I'm not convinced, right? Like, I need to see the data about, like, I, th I have a hunch that, like, way more restrictions on handguns would make the difference. But whether that implies a buyback, I'm not sure, right? Like, maybe you grandfather in a whole bunch, right? We've seen with the, with, with the NFA, right, with the automatic firearms, like, it's expensive to buy an automatic firearm, right? Like, uh, it didn't used to be. Um, you could order Tommy guns, right? Uh, by mail. Um, so, like, whether or not, like, a, like a ban on new sales of handguns or, like, stricter licensing or, like, uh, preventing people from concealed carrying handguns or implies a buyback is a, is a difficult question. Um, I, will, I will point out that um, buybacks, buybacks um, 
even in Australia, which doesn't have quite the same like gun culture that is in the United States, there's nothing like it. In fact, um, and the the buyback didn't get every gun right. Like they spent a lot of money buying back everyone's semi-automatic weapons, and I think they got. 66% of them or 70% of them ultimately. Now like 15 years, 20 years later, like it's those guns have kind of aged out and they've kind of dripped in and like, you know, you occasionally get them confiscated and that, that sort of thing. But like would a large scale confiscation or buyback regime of like people's antique um, like guns that have been handed down from their grandfathers that have like been in the family for years, right? Amongst people, you know, who have really strong and antipathy towards like government overreach in the United States, whether it would work or, man, I don't know. Right. Uh, Professor Shaw, would you like to give the last word on this question? Yeah, I would like to say something about um, Australia's buyback program. So the buyback worked temporarily in reducing the number of guns in Australia, but. As, as uh, Dr. Harrington pointed out, you know, 20 years later, the amount of guns that are, are in Australia now are basically at pre-buyback levels. And it's not clear that the ban reduced um, suicides or homicides. Suicides and homicides in Australia were already on a declining trend after the buy, before the buyback. So, to, so people sometimes say, well, Australia's gun, gun buyback model worked in reducing homicides and suicides. Well, they were already declining prior to the buyback, so it's not clear as if you, that you can attribute the decline to the buyback. Another thing I'd mention is that there seems, and of course this is, this is not something I would say definitively, there seems to be a substitution effect. So the um, Australian buyback was initiated in response to a mass shooting. Now, in the 20 or so years after the buyback, there have been no mass shootings. However, mass murders haven't stopped. After the Australian buyback, you had at least five mass murders in which people were killed using non-gun weapons. Now, interestingly enough, prior to the buyback, you didn't have those mass murders using non-gun weapons. You had mass murders using gun weapons. So what seemed to happen uh, was that you had a substitution effect. People still killed people. Um, Mass murders still happened. People just decided to use different objects to do that. So it's not clear that um, the gun buyback reduced uh, mass shootings at all, as opposed to just creating a substitution effect. So it's not it's not at all clear to me that the Australian gun buyback model worked. All right, so that's all the time we have for tonight. Let me make some final announcements, uh, and then we'll be able to leave. Let me f let's first give a round of applause to both of our speakers tonight. Um, so before you leave, uh, please go to Anna in the back. She has uh, the email sign-up list for you. So if you'd like to keep up with more of our events, with more debates and discussions in the future, then please uh, just consider signing up with her. And I think the clipboard is right there. So uh, Yes, so if you'd like more resources, just go back to Anna. And finally, um, so Young Americans for Liberty, we meet every first Saturday and last Saturday of the month doing different things. Uh, we won't be meeting next, the, the, first, uh, the first Saturday of next month. Uh, we usually meet between 1 to 3 p.m. That's because we're going to be doing a weekend warrior project. We're going out to a different state and uh, doing some political activism. I do need uh, a fellow friend to come along with me, so if you'd like to come along, just talk to me afterwards, and let's go have some fun. So thank you so much, and have a great night. Have a fun road trip if you want to help us make Liberty people win. <laughs>